around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. This is Pastor David Langford, and we welcome you today to this edition of The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. It's always a great joy to be with you to share from the Word of the Living God. We welcome you today. It's Monday, November the 5th. My, 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 how the year has almost passed us. We're almost at the end of the year. And without a doubt, somehow, someway, time has accelerated. That was the word I received in 2012 uh, while fasting. And God put that word in my spirit, acceleration, that everything would begin to accelerate. And I am confident, I am certitude, we are witnessing that right now in America. Well, tomorrow will be November the 6th. Tuesday. It is the day of midterm elections, 2018. I want to invite you. May I coerce you? May I drive you to go and vote and vote your convictions and vote the Word of God? Without a doubt, strongholds, strongholds are fighting this nation profusely. Demonic powers are working tremendously. People regretfully have given themselves over to Satan, the enemy. And there are those who are deceived. As I said the other night on the Hagman program, deceived people do not recognize truth. Their conscience is unable to recognize the truth. You put the truth before them like a stop sign, but their disposition has been so overwhelmed by the spirit of delusion, by the spirit of seduction, by the spirit of deception. They cannot see the truth, though it's right before them. Even Pilate, said about Christ, I find no fault in him. But the Jews cried adamantly, crucify him, crucify him. And so it was, and so it is. Again, let me encourage you to take someone with you. Go with someone. Go pick up someone. Uh, go get a neighbor that may not have transportation. And uh, take them with you. Let's believe God for a, a red wave. I'm, I'm believing God for a minimum of 55 senatorial seats in the conservative section of the Senate. 55. I'd love to see 56. And uh, God can do anything. God can do anything. And God willing... He'll help us to keep control of the House. God forbid that Nancy Pelosi, Maxine Waters, and Dianne Feinstein, and all these, these women who are in authority and power, let's pray that God will not suffer the wicked to rule over us. That is their desire. But I pray that God will insulate us and keep us from this type of tyranny. Now, they would be those who'd say, well, that's a cynical statement, Pastor. No, 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 no. You will witness tyranny if those people are allowed to take over both houses. And as Lindsey Graham made the statement, in a infuriated angry way, he said, I pray to God, you never get power. Because the debacle, the debasedness of the Kavanaugh hearings. Now, I know Brett Kavanaugh is a Catholic. But see, even God can use Brett Kavanaugh 
for the purpose of stopping abortion, murdering children. So God can use anyone. God can use anything. God can use a circumstance uh, to bring forth his will. And for that, we keep praying. I, I don't have the intellectualism to sit on a Supreme Court seat. But see, God can take somebody like Judge Kavanaugh. He could take somebody like Donald Trump, who's not a politician. The guy is as uh, cantankerous. Uh, he's so rigid. Uh, he's so uncouth. Uh, but see, God takes foolish things for the purpose of confounding the world. And as Paul well said in 1 Corinthians 1, 29, that no flesh should glory in his presence. No flesh should glory in his presence. We want to pick back up today from Psalms 107. We spoke of verse 1 last Tuesday. Picking back up today, we'll read verses 1, 2, and 3. Psalms 107, beginning at verse 1. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy, and gather them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. We're talking about Elohim delivering by his word. There's no greater power, I said there's no greater power than the power of the Word of God. God's Word is so powerful that he created the heavens and the earth. He spoke them into mere existence, not taking substance and creating it, but merely speaking the Word and the world was framed. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 4, where the word of a king is, there is power. This is why he is deemed king of kings and lord of lords, because wherever, whenever his word is spoken, whenever his word goes forth, divine things begin to happen. And thus we witnessed the rebellion of the Israelites in Psalms 106, but now in Psalms 107, we witness as God rescues his people. Don't ever think that Satan can get you in a position or a posture or a particular place wherein that God cannot deliver you. God has the power to deliver you from any and everything. And all God has to do is just speak the word. Speak the word. The centurion. Centurion means he was a captain of 100 men, like century 100. He understood the authority. He said, Lord, just speak the word. Just utter words from your lips, and I know that my servant will be healed. I know that my servant will absolutely be made whole. That is all that God has to do. And there are all types of angelic creatures and beings at God's disposal. Thus, David said in Psalms 103, verse 20, Bless the Lord, ye his angels, that excel in strength, that do his commandments, hearkening unto the voice of his word. Notice how he laid that verse out. Bless the Lord, ye his angels. So what, what does that mean? Bless the Lord, ye his angels. Revelation 4, 8 says, The cherubim, the seraphim, they rest not day or night, crying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. David is talking to angels. Then he says how great they are and that they excel 
and strength. In other words, these are mighty, mighty, powerful, anointed cherubs. God can use them as he wills because he says in the verse that do his commandments. You know, I believe there is such conformity and synchronicity in heaven that when Jesus Christ says anything, angels that are under this category, that category, like a messenger angel, like Gabriel, but I'm sure there are more than one messenger angel. There's numerous, maybe innumerable messenger angels, just like Michael is deemed a warring angel. Where do we get that? Revelation 12 and 7, and there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. What a revelation I just got right there, just by merely quoting that verse. I when I when I first said this just a moment ago, there are innumerable angels dedicated to certain things like messenger angels. Then I just made the statement, Michael was a warring angel. That verse just now clarified in my own mind, there are innumerable warring angels. Let's quote it again, Revelation 12 and 7. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought, but he prevails not. Michael and his warring angels prevail. So there's obviously a type of hierarchical government. And Michael has at his disposal warring angels because he is the archangel of war. So watch this. There are innumerable messenger angels. There are innumerable warring angels. We don't know how many different types of angels that there are. But David said, bless the Lord, ye his angels that excel in strength. So that tells me there are angels of mere strength. What kind of strength? I don't know. But I'm sure their strength is multifaceted. And they are qualified. They are able to do things that you and I could never, ever comprehend. So these angels, when God says, smite Satan in this location, they don't look at each other and say, "Uh, who's he talking to? Are you going or am I going? I believe there is such synchronicity, such conformity, such uh, cohesiveness in the kingdom of God that when Christ says anything, these angels immediately know what to do. They excel in strength and that do his commandments hearkening unto the voice of his word. So whatever God through Jesus were to say, go deliver Pastor Lankford. Uh, go deliver so-and-so. Whoever it might be, and we know we have angels. We have guardian angels. Think about what I'm saying today. He sent his word, Psalms 107, verse 2, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them out of all of their destruction. He just speaks the word those delegated angels for the circumstance or situation hear the word or hear his commandment, and they immediately go and they do what he has willed for them to do. So when God said he sent his word, now I want to take that a step further. The word of God in itself. Now, if, if, if somebody said, well, pastor, describe the word. Well, Jesus is the word. John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word was God. But the word of God is described sometimes as a hammer. Jeremiah 23, 29. It's not my word like as a hammer, saith the Lord. Excuse me. It's not my word like as a fire, saith the Lord. And like a hammer that breaketh the rock into pieces. Notice that now. The word of God is described as a fire. The word of God is described as a hammer. This is to help you and I understand the power, the deity, and the majesty of God. We limit God, and God is not limited. Listen to what I'm saying. He framed the world with his words. 
He didn't take a substance like a piece of wood and make a, a, a baseball bat. No, no, there was nothing there. There was no substance. There was, there was nothing there that God take, took and made. He created all of this out of his mere words, creation. That's why he's the creator, and we are the creation, the creature. God does this in his sovereignty. And nobody but God uh, can take his word in that manner and frame the world he framed the world with his words alone. He 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 didn't he he didn't have to have have a, a a substance. He didn't have to have some kind of material substance pre-existing to make the earth. Every angel is subject to him. Uh, Hebrews 1, or excuse me, Hebrews 2, verse 5, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come whereof we speak. Now that's a, that's a, that's a profound statement. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come wherever we speak. So if the angels are not going to help rule the coming new heaven and new earth, who will then reign? Oh, Christ and you and I. Revelation 1, 6 says, He hath made us both kings and priests. We're going to, we're going to reign with Christ. So the angels, though they will be, still exist and be there and have some obviously part in the eternal kingdom of God, Paul said, for unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come. So they are, they are not in subjection to the world that is to come. So the word of God literally, physically framed the world out of nothing and hung it on nothing, and it all works in synchronicity. It all works in a synchronous manner, every every part of it. So when the psalmist says, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. How did he do that? He sent his word. He sent his word. He sent his word. Now, that's, of course, Psalms 107 and 20. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. But you see, because we have been delivered, we should be saying so. We should be declaring. We should be crying aloud in this nefarious and wicked world that we live in. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Who are the redeemed? The redeemed are those who are purchased by and through the blood of Jesus Christ. The only way we were purchased, the only way we were redeemed was by the blood of Jesus Christ. Paul in Ephesians 1, 7 says, in whom... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin, according to the riches of his grace. Now, Paul almost quotes that same passage again, almost identically in Colossians 1.14, which reads, In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. He leaves off the last phrase, according to the riches of his grace. And he adds the one word, even, between Ephesians 1 and 7 and Colossians 1 and 14. Very, very little different uh, difference there, but it is a, a, a divine nuance in the Scriptures. So when you read Ephesians 1 and 7, Paul almost quotes it exactly again in, in Colossians 1 and 14. Then John on the, on the Isle of Patmos, said in Revelation 1, 5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. 
washed us from our sins and his blood. It is the blood that atones for sin. It is the blood that washes away sin. It's not anything else. It is the blood of Jesus Christ. What did, what did John say? In whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. That was Paul. Revelation 1, 5. Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. That was John. I quoted Ephesians 1 and 7 and said Revelation 1, 5. They understood the element of cleansing was by the blood of Jesus, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sin. It is the blood that cleanses. It is the blood that forgives. And then again, Revelation 1, 5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Then Peter, understanding the, gra the, the, the gravity, the power, the majesty that is in the blood, he says to us in 1 Peter 1, 17 through 20, And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, past the time of your sojourning, here in fear, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, as silver and gold, from your vain or worthless lifestyle, vain conversation, received by tradition from your fathers. Traditions are damnable. I'm afraid too many times we become purveyors of tradition more than a purveyor of the word of God. For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation or your worthless lifestyle received by tradition from your fathers. Everything that's traditional is worthless. It is a worthless, frivolous lifestyle. What does Peter say redeems us here in 1 Peter 1 and 19? But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb, without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. Before Elohim ever created heaven and earth, it was already predestined, predetermined that Jesus Christ would die on an old rugged cross and shed his red royal crimson blood that men could have an access back to the Father, having a divine relationship. Peter calls it divine nature. This is, this is what you want in your walk with God. You want the divine nature of Christ to be living in you, to be exercised in you, to be a part of you, but the only way you can ever receive the divine nature is by the blood of Jesus Christ. It's like a, a blood uh, transfusion. People sometimes are near the point of death, and they need a pint of blood. They need two pints of blood because if you don't have enough blood, your body will die because that is the life source is in the blood. Leviticus 17, 11 says, for the life of of the flesh is in the blood. Without blood, there is no life. Without blood, there can no uh, elements, substances, oxygen, mineral supplies cannot be carried to the organs of the body except it be through blood. Blood is an unusual, usual liquid or fluid, however you want to call it, because it has life. That supernatural life 
is applied to your eternal spirit and soul by the blood of Jesus Christ, when that now lives in your clay jar, your earthen vessel, you then begin to take on the divine nature of God. Well, how do I know that? Second Peter 1 and 4 says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. It is the divine nature of God working in your life that delivers you, that saves you from the the crud and the lust and the greed and the covetousness of this world. Again, how does that take place by and through faith in the vicarious, efficacious work of Christ on the cross, because we have been redeemed. David says here in Psalms 107 to let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you've been redeemed, if you have been bought back to Christ, not brought like bringing something, but bought, purchased, purchased, you've been purchased, not with silver, not with gold. The ransom that was paid for sin's debt was the blood of Jesus Christ. Psalms, uh, excuse me, Mark 10, 45, for even the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life for a ransom for many. Did you get that? Jesus Christ, life, was given for a ransom. He paid the debt. He paid what sin demanded. You see, that's where he literally fulfilled the law. He paid the law. He paid the sin's debt. I'll quote it again, Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Why not for all? Because all will not accept Christ. So it's going to be just for many, but not all. Because all will not, shall not embrace Christ as their Lord and Savior. Many are called, but few are what? Few are chosen. Why are few chosen? The reason few are chosen is because only a few will choose him. Oh, he calls. He pleads. He begs relentlessly. He sends forth his warring angels at his commandments. He does everything that he can to try to bring people into the kingdom of God. But you know what? They still spurn. They still reject. They still cast off. God. They, they, don't, they don't want God. They simply do not want God in their lives. So many people today, they don't want God. They, they don't want God. Because you see, God residing, abiding, aboding in your life demands loyalty and discipleship. It's demanded of you. It is demanded of you that you live a certain way, that you act a certain way, that you walk a certain way. But when that way becomes difficult, in time of adversity, time of persecution, time of pain, time of sorrow, time of suffering, they say, well, I I don't know that I want to, Continue to walk that way. The reason we should magnify God, let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom the Lord hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Why? You and I were subject to eternal separation and death from God. The rich man in hell is still, to this day, separated from God. Eternal separation. 
And Hebrews 2 and 14 says this, For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. What did he take part of? Flesh and blood. He bled just like any mortal man. He hurt like any mortal man. When they plucked the hairs from his face, it hurt like any mortal man. When they beat his back and they plowed those furrows into his back, he hurt just like any other man. So when Paul is conveying this message to us, he says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same there is nothing that you are going through or experiencing or suffering that Christ cannot, with all reality, not understand. He fully understands where you are in your life right now. And notice the disposition of Christ on the cross. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. This is why Christ took the keys of death and hell. Keys are signs, signatures of authority. So when he died and was raised from the dead as a, as a mortal being, yes, he was God, but he was mortal, and he died a natural death. But having been raised from the dead, allowed him, suffered him, tolerated him to therefore take the keys of death and of hell. And here's what Paul said here in uh, Hebrews 2.15. And deliver them, you and I, who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. In the Old Testament... They died. They went to a place called paradise. That was why Jesus said to the thief on the cross, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. He went to the same place Abraham went to. Lazarus died. He went to the same place. Not Lazarus in, in uh, John chapter 11, but Lazarus in Luke chapter 15. The rich man died. He went to hell. Lazarus was seen in Abraham's bosom. So it wasn't purgatory. There's no such thing. And it wasn't hell. And they weren't in heaven. They were in paradise. But when Jesus, Jesus himself was raised from the dead, he took the keys of death and hell. Death and hell are entities. If you don't believe it, go back and read uh, Revelation chapter 6. You'll see the two entities, the, the, the death and hell ride the chloros, the pale horse. They are, they are entities. They are something that exists. Death is an enemy. But Paul says here in Hebrews 2.15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage, for verily he took not on him the nature of angels, but he took on him the seed of Abraham. Why did he not take on the nature of angels? Angels cannot die. Jesus Christ had to come take on the absolute nature of of all humanity, pain, suffering, sorrow, weeping, laughter, joy, whatever. He, he was, here's what Paul said in Hebrews 4, 15, for we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Now, angels can sin, but angels never die. Once God created an angel, that angel exists. You exist in a spiritual form, in a soulish realm. Your flesh will return back to the earth from which it came. 
So Jesus, to usurp and take the power of death and hell, he had to take on the nature of the seed of Abraham. Oh, my God, that'll preach. Galatians 3, 29. If ye are Abraham's seed, then are you Christ. Oh, if, you, if you're if you of the seed of Abraham, oh, that means you're, you're of Jesus Christ, bought by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. And that's important. That is, as, that is of great significance in your life. If you're going to be saved, you have to be saved through the biological anatomical seed that was in Abraham. See? But there were it was more. This is why Abraham was such a founding great father. Jesus would say, I'm I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's the lineage in which I came through. So in Galatians 3, 29, Paul said, if ye be Christ, if you are a professing child of the living God, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. You, You have the same eternal inheritance, the exact same inheritance that Abraham was promised. Why? Because if you are redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, it is because of Abraham's seed. This is why we talk about the promised seed. Ishmael was not the promised seed. It can only salvation can only come through the promised seed. Anything else is erroneous seed. It's just not right. Let the redeemed say so, whom he, Jesus, the Lord's Christ, hath redeemed from the hand of the enemy and gathered them out of the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. God has gathered men, and that's rhetorical, mankind, from the four corners of the earth. And all that are alive, all that are in the grave, but they all must have been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ, will all rise from the four corners of the earth at his second coming, his second advent. His second, second coming. The second coming of Jesus is fundamentally the blessed hope in its entirety. Titus 2.11, for the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Christ Jesus. That is the hope. The protocol is found in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall be raised first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore... Comfort ye one another with these words. Christ is going to return. We're told by the Apostle Peter in 2 Peter 3, 3 and 4, knowing this first, that there shall come scoffers in the last days, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. From the beginning of the creation. In other words, they're going to say, oh, everything's just like it's always been. No. This is what Peter said would happen. He said they would they would come scoffers. A scoffer is nothing but a mere mocker. They mock God. They mock his word. They mock everything about him. See? But he said, knowing this first, 
that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lust and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Now, I want to say something here that may upset a few. I'm kind of somewhat renowned for upsetting people. Kingdom now theology. We're going to get the earth ready, and Jesus Christ will come. Folks, you can't have a kingdom without a king. You've got to have a king to say, this is the kingdom of so-and-so. For us to ever decree, to ever declare the kingdom of God, Christ, that's why he said, pray thy kingdom come. Somehow people have gotten theology misconstrued, and somehow they think we're going to get the earth ready for Jesus. Uh, well, you might say the devil's going to get the earth ready for Jesus, but and why do I say that? Because in Revelation 11, verse 18, they're destroying the earth. That's the impetus, the cause of Christ to return before they do destroy the earth. And he intervenes and destroys them that are destroying the earth. That's exactly what Jesus does. He destroys the Antichrist with the mere brightness of his coming. Revelation 11, verse 18, and the nations were angry. Thy wrath is come. See, we're not appointed unto God's wrath. So it's now, this is the seventh trumpet. Go back and read all this. Revelation chapter 10, verse 7. That is the last trumpet when the mystery of God should be revealed as he hath revealed unto his servants the prophets. What is the mystery? 1 Corinthians 15, 51, 52, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound. You know, people say, well, Paul didn't know there were seven trumpets. Paul knew about the seven trumpets. That's why he deemed the last trumpet. Remember 2 Corinthians 12, Paul was taken up into the heavens, showing things that were so exceeding. He says, it's not lawful for me to come back and tell you all the things that I saw. We, we couldn't handle Listen, people fight and fuss and argue over the word of God now. What if we had more to argue over? Wow. Revelation eleven eighteen, and the nations were angry. And thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. Now, that can't be the wicked dead. That's a thousand years later. But pre-tribulationists will tell you something different. They'll tell you something that's absolutely erroneous. Tell me who are these that God is going to judge that are dead, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. Now we've got to start preaching multiple judgments. Well, he, he judged the church in the pre-tribulation rapture. This is another rapture. This is another resurrection. So now he's going to have to judge them. He, he, they make this stuff as, up as they go along, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and shouldest destroy them which destroy the earth. So look, look, look at that right there. Should us give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, the saints, and them that fear thy name. Revelation twenty two twelve. Behold, I come quickly. My reward is with me to give every man according as his works shall be. This is all so synchronous. And yet men dissect it, shred it, tear it apart, castigate it, do and say so many things that are just not godly, not scriptural, none whatsoever. And then he brings his rewards with him. That's you and I, and he's going to destroy them, which destroy the earth. Now, if God doesn't intervene, there's no doubt in my mind the earth would be destroyed. Artificial intelligence, artificial intelligence. It is coming to pass. And that was why Hugo de Garris was 
so relevant at the True Legends Conference in Branson, Missouri. And while I'm on the subject, I'm going to try, I hope I will succeed, and I will, by God's grace and your prayers, trying to have a conference in Charlotte, North Carolina in the spring of next year, 2019. And I want Steve Quell to come. I want Hugo DeGarris to come, of course, myself and other couple of men. But we want to launch out into the deep. We want to do more for the kingdom of God. I need your prayers. I need your support to launch out in this endeavor to take the time to try to have, I'd love to have no less than two and as many as four a year in different parts of the country. And of course, Steve and I have talked. I'm not going to compete with my brother. But right now, my goal is to maybe have a conference this coming late March, early April, and then one sometime uh, in October of 2019. Try to do two next year. I need your prayers. I need your love. I need your support to help me with this. I'm not going to ask for money, but it takes money to rent buildings, sound systems, videos, the whole gamut. Pray with me. And and these are going to be, uh, how do I say this? Uh, we're going to put a lot of emphasis on preaching the word and the Holy Ghost. That's the emphasis. That's what we want to be purveyors of. And uh, the reason I would like for Hugo de Garris to be there, though he is a he went from an atheist to an agnostic to a deist, and I told him to his face, I said, Brother, you're on a head-on collision course with Almighty God. That's the design he spoke of that he can't put together. Why would you want somebody like that at your conference, Pastor? I want the Christians to understand what's coming. What's coming? And uh, we'll be probably, without a doubt, working with Brother Baxter. We want him to come and be a part of that. And we're going to be very judicious uh, in getting the people uh, around us that are like-minded, that hearts are in tune with the Word of God, that are in tune with the Holy Ghost. I do not want to be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. I don't want to be uh, paired up with people who... Uh, are not walking in the Spirit of God, are not led by the Holy Ghost. But I can manage and take care of somebody like Hugo de Garris, but his message, his message is so significant. So please, please pray for us. Uh, we're making a lot of changes here at the ministry. Uh, the fact that we have Stephen and Jasmine Wood here with us and working with us, uh, has helped accelerate the ministry, the things we're trying to accomplish, the things we're trying to do. Uh, we are reworking our website. You'll probably see a change in that in the coming days. We're doing everything we can because I am so old school. We need to accelerate uh, the communication, the technology, the ability to live stream. We're trying to do a lot of things to help you. And I know that you know I'm going to keep preaching the Word of God. I'm not going to preach heresy, fallacy, mendacities, uh, cynical, ludicrous ideologies. Absolutely never, 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 never. But the unsearchable riches of Christ, our Lord and our Savior. So tentatively, look at late March, early April for a conference in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. We have a lot of work to do. I've never done one of these. We have a lot of work to do to get the website up to where you can go and register. Uh, we're going we're to do, just like Steve has always done, a $100 registration fee. That covers the motel, the sound system, the video equipment, all the things that you need in that. This is what this pays for. Uh, and people need to understand those things are costly. 
They're costly. And I hear so many times, fellowship, fellowship, like-minded believers. Well, if you'll pray and fast and help support us, we're going to start out trying to have two next year. And if God intervenes and we get this thing wrapped and packaged and get it seamless, we'll probably go to a four-year, one a quarter, and we'll come uh, up, up into the north. We need to come up around where the Hagmans are and have a conference. For those of you who are up in the north, but we're, we're desirous uh, to be purveyors of God's word, and we need your aid, your help, and your assistance. If you'll help me, God will do his part. And God's part is anointing and saving the lost, redeeming the lost, so that others can say, we too have been redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ. So let me encourage you today to lift us up in prayer. Stand with us. Stand with us in every sense of the word. Don't be a supporter in word only, but in a deed. Do something. Do something to help us to do the will of God. Uh, As I said, tentatively, our goal is to have our first conference next March, late March, early April, and the first two people that we're putting down, or I should say three in all reality, is Steve Quayle, Hugo DeGarris, and Brother Irvin Baxter, and of course myself, and then we're going to bring in another couple of people. Uh, Alan Marcotte is going to be helping me. Uh, he's become a dear brother, a great, great friend. He and his wife, Debbie, have uh, been precious people, precious friends to my wife and I, to the ministry. And uh, when I was led of the Lord to start going in this direction, Brother Allen was the man God put on my heart. He said, yoke up with Brother Allen, Marcotte. He's going to help you, and, uh, and I know he will help me. Him and Debbie both are great, great Christians, great people of God. I love to work with the redeemed because the redeemed are workable. Amen. God bless you. Have a great, 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 great day. We'll see you tomorrow in the Lord Jesus Christ. Keep praying. Don't forget to vote your convictions and the Word of God. The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.